So we've seen so far how commitment strategies are used very effectively by salespeople, but the consistency technique has also been used to brainwash American prisoners of war during the Korean War. In this war, the communists in Korea were backed by the Chinese communists fighting the West. It was a terrible long war and millions of people died. Let's fast forward through all that and get to the end. American soldiers who had been held captive by the enemy are starting to come home and people start to notice this bizarre thing, which is that many of them came home with pro-communist attitudes and many of those people, it turned out, had collaborated with the enemy. This is really bizarre because that's not something that American soldiers were known for. In World War II, in the face of brutal treatment by the Japanese soldiers, there was very little collaboration with the enemy, very little betrayal, and yet here it was quite high. Something that really concerned people was that it wasn't every prisoner of war or POW camp that was effective in doing this. For the Korean-run POW camps, those soldiers came back relatively normal. It was the Chinese-run POW camps that seemed to cause these conversions into communist sympathisers. The American officials panicked. They're like, what is the secret of these Chinese interrogators that allows them to brainwash the soldiers? The CIA had people within their organisation doing crazy experiments on telepathy, hypnosis, LSD and all sorts of crazy things trying to work out what this mind power was. Turns out the Chinese weren't using LSD to brainwash. It wasn't hypnosis, it's just straightforward social psychology. What the Korean soldiers were doing, which was ineffective remember, is the classic torture techniques. Beating people up, depriving them of sleep, putting a gun to their heads and screaming abuse at them, trying to get them to shout out communist propaganda. You can pretty much get people to say anything with a gun pointed at your head. That's not a particularly good influence technique because as soon as the gun is gone, those people are just going to go back to their original attitudes. What the Chinese interrogators did is quite different though. They had quiet conversations with the captives and they tried to get them to admit to something mildly pro-communist or mildly anti-American, such as asking them, can you admit that America is not perfect? This didn't seem like such a big deal. People would go, no country is perfect, so yes, I guess I can admit that. And they're like, really? How? You must have reasons. They might come up with three or four reasons why America is not perfect. And they're like, okay, what you've just told me, do you mind writing that down in bullet points? Now you're writing down three or four problems of America. Okay, well, that was kind of helpful, but maybe it would be even better if you just elaborate on those bullet points. Now, just turn it into an essay. Can you see what's happening? Remember, there's no gun pointed at your head. No threat, no rewards. You find yourself writing this anti-American essay. Do you mind reading out that essay to me? So you're reading it and they record it and they play it back to you. You hear your own words and they play it back over the loudspeakers in the POW camps. Everyone around you can hear you reading out that essay. And you have to try and make sense of that. Why did I do that? Often, if you find yourself behaving in a certain way that seems different from your self-image, your self-image can shift to align with that behaviour. People start to see themselves as potentially communist. They start to see themselves as potentially collaborators and work from that. By the way, if you're wondering if any of this can be used for something positive in this day and age, there's another study. The American Cancer Foundation relies on door knockers to get money. They were struggling to find volunteers and they approached a social psychologist and he said, leave it with me. What he did is he rang a whole bunch of people in a community and pretended to be asking them this personality questionnaire. One of the questions was, imagine, hypothetically, a charity calls you and wants to know if you're prepared to donate some of your time to do door knocking. What do you think you'd say? Now, imagine if you got that question in a phone survey. I don't know what kind of person you are. Maybe you'd do that, maybe you wouldn't. But I'm pretty positive that you'd like to think of yourself as the kind of person who would do that. Many people would say, yes, yes, I think actually, I think I would. Now, of course, a few days later, the American Cancer Foundation actually rings asking for door knockers. And of course, you say yes. It turns out this intervention was successful in increasing volunteerism by 700%. 
it's really cheap as chips to make this additional call ahead as an intervention, but it gives a massive payoff. So the consistency technique can be really effective when it's possible to point out an existing commitment or belief that's consistent with the request being made. Basically, what you do is make an existing commitment more salient. When we do this, our desire for consistency then influences our behaviour so that it's more in line with our past behaviours.